Tassi and the quality of that great figure and the admiration that the Rambam held for Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, um, you know, for the, for the project of, of organizing the Mishnah. And in the fourth chapter of the introduction to the Mishnah commentary, and I just remind you what I've said probably a dozen times already, uh, the Rambam didn't divide these into chapters, and depending upon which edition you're looking at, the chapter markings uh, may vary. But in this uh, fourth chapter, according to the Shilat edition, which we've been using, the Rambam now has a discussion of the the form, the format of the of the Mishnah Torah, of the Mishnah Torah, of the Mishnah, of the Torah Shabbat Pet. The the uh, Mishnah is divided into. I mean, here we have this little handy chart divided into Shisha Sidre Mishnah. This, I no doubt, is a review for some people. So, if it is, you can just chalk it up to uh, the good efforts of, of reviewing what you know. And if it's new, then certainly it's worthwhile. Um, the Mishnah is divided into six Sidarim, or six what we call in English six orders. I don't know what that means in order, but it means a, a classification of knowledge. And, and again, the Rambam admires uh, Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi's uh, undertaking, both for the style in which he cast rabbinic literature up until that point, around the year 200 CE, as well as the form in the, the organization which he which he greatly admires, and which uh, which he himself. Uh, although striking out in a new path, when he writes the Mishnah Torah a thousand years later, almost a thousand years later, um, the the uh, the Rambam admires the the the, the efforts to organize uh, all of rabbinic literature, all of halacha, all of Torah Shabbat Peh into uh, some kind of order. Uh, so the Shisha Sidre Mishnah, um, which are sometimes abbreviated, which are which sometimes abbreviated, we, we call it Shast, uh, Shin Samech, uh, Shisha Sidre, the six orders is abbreviated as Shas. Colloquially, we refer to Shas as a set of Talmud, the, the encyclopedic collection of books that you will see on a shelf. The set of the Babylonian Talmud, the Talmud Bavli, we refer to as as a Shas. But that's a little bit of a misnomer um, because Shas technically refers to the six orders of the Mishnah, which of course forms the backbone of the Talmud, as we'll see later, as we'll see later tonight. But um, but technically speaking, is referring to the referring to the Mishnah upon which the Talmud, the the Gemara, is is organized. Um, Let's look at the Rambam, and then we're going to come back to this. We're going to come back to this chart. The Rambam says, "Kasher ratsa lechaber zeh hasefer al zot hatavnit ra lechalko lechalakim." When he, Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, wanted to compose this work, the Mishnah, on a certain format, a tavnit is a frame of, or a format. He thought that it was proper to divide it into different sections. Now, it, it, it's interesting, of course, because the Rambam, I guess, is assuming that there might have been a different way to organize to organize the, the Mishnah. I was thinking about this the other day um, when somebody was explaining this to me. Uh, somebody, um, you know, one of these computer fellows was, what is it called? Uh, Ezra, if you're on and listening, you can type in and, and share, your, share your wisdom with us. Um, to defragment my computer, but apparently the way that the the way that the computer stores all the information on the hard drive um, is like you know like a series of uh, boxes, um, and and I mean and somebody must know understand this better than I. Um, Ezra, are you there? Ezra, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. So explain, explain. Have you been listening to what I'm talking about? Yeah. Yep. So explain to everybody how this works, because it's going to serve as a metaphor for what I'm talking about. 
Um, basically, as you're correct about the frag, um, different boxes in your hard drive, and it tells you good and bad um, the different sectors in the hard drive, it's good or if it's good or bad. Uh, but as it nice. also clears out unused space so that you can more effectively fit things in. Right. Isn't that correct? Yep. Right. So, in other words, the organization of knowledge. Okay, thank you, Ezra. You can mute yourself again if you wish. Um, uh, the organization of knowledge. Uh, so, for example, if you think about the Dewey Decimal System. I remember when I was a kid in school, in, in grade school, I assume this is true for, for many of you, uh, one of the things that you know you learned in elementary school is how to use a library. Um, and you went and you explained, you know, that the that the accomplishments of uh, the Dewey Decimal System, uh, which then I think was still in fashion, now I think the Library of Congress system, but the same it's the same idea that y if you organize the books in the library by topic, you need to have some kind of knowledge tree that mm -hmm. explains how the how the different fields of knowledge relate to each other. That there would be general fields of knowledge. Under, so, for example, there's, a, there's one field of knowledge called religion, and under religion, there's uh, there's a philosophy of religion, and then there's uh, Judaism, and there's Christianity, and there's Islam, and there's Hinduism and Buddhism, etc. So that all the books on on Hinduism will be, you know, more or less in the same section. But even then, within Judaism, it would be divided, subdivided by. Uh, 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 you know, Jewish history, um, uh, um, the denominationally, uh, rabbinic literature, biblical literature, etc., 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 and all the books would be organized. You know, and then by using the decimals, in other words, if you have two, if you have, if you have five books in a row that are thematically related in such a way that they need to be there, so and then somebody publishes a new book which really belongs thematically between book two and book three. Just by using the decimal system, you can, in other words, if this is book 2.1 and the one next to it is book 2.2, .2, and you need to now reorganize your conception of knowledge, uh, um, you could put uh, a book 2.15 in between those two, and you'd be able to constantly, by constantly adding decimals, you'd be constantly able to expand or contract or etc. Um, when uh, when the National Library was founded in Yerushalayim in the early part of the 20th century. They followed the Dewey Decimal System, but they had a problem because, in other words, in a general library, whatever the decimal system for Judaism is, is sufficient. But at the National Library in Yerushalayim, which was meant to be the premier library of, of all Jewish publishing, you know, they, asked, they asked the Jewish communities throughout the world to send them books, that all Jewish books, that it should be the repository of this. This is the library. It's the proto-library of what became the, the, what's today called the National and University Library. It, it kind of evolved. It morphed into the library of the Hebrew University, but it, it predates the Hebrew University. It was originally housed, I think, on, uh, now it's at the campus on Givat Ram, but it was originally housed, I think, on uh, Rehov B'nai Brit. You know, on the outskirts of, of Mea Sharim, believe it or not, um, and uh, the the uh, the problem was that when you had a library that was much, much, much fuller by many orders of magnitude than whatever uh, Jewish libraries, whatever general libraries had, it, it was it was too uh, uh, it was too rough. So the librarian, who at the time I believe was uh, Gershon Shalom. The, the, who, who later went on to become the great scholar of Kabbalah, he devised for the Jewish section of the of the system, he devised an expanded tree. But this idea that you can constantly expand the tree out to contain the knowledge is a is a is a sense of how to organize of how to organize knowledge. Um, and it doesn't have to be that way. And you can conceive of many different. I mean, I, I, I'm setting up this metaphor. I hope I haven't overdone it. You can conceive of different ways of organizing knowledge, and as long as, in theory, you can just organize the books in a library uh, based alphabetically by author or yeah. by when they get acquired, and as long as the user has a way of 
finding the book. You look in the card catalog and it tells you where it is on the shelf. It doesn't really matter what's next to it on the shelf. Um, and that's the way the computer works. When your Word documents, for example, your Word documents, that's all a, that's all a, you know, the idea that you have um, files and folders and that there's an actual icon of a manila, of a manila folder or a manila file, that's just a, a device that helps us conceptualize how it all works because we are all used to those old-fashioned manila folders. In a generation from now, computers aren't going to organize it that way because that will be a visual metaphor that will be meaningless to our children and grandchildren who don't remember manila file folders because nobody will have papers anymore to put into a manila file folder. But this idea that in my documents on my computer, I have any number of files, and each file can have subdirectories and et cetera, that doesn't mean that that's the way that the, that the computer actually stores them. Right? In other words, it yeah. doesn't mean that in my in the computer this one word document actually physically lives next to the next word document. It's mm -hmm. just a way of accessing it and archiving it to help me locate what I'm doing. The mission could have been done in a, in a similar way. We can conceive of a parallel universe in which the mission is organized differently. Um, it makes sense to us that it would be organized thematically. But it might have also been organized by by the by the Tana. There might have been a Masechta that had all of the teachings of Rabbi Akiva, and another Masechta that had all of the teachings of Rabbi Hoshua, and another Masechta that had all of the teachings of, of Rabbi Meir, who who serves as the the great backbone of the Mishnah. Um, we say generally generally speaking that anonymous Mishnayot or Mishnayot that are not assigned authorship uh, to to someone. Those anonymous Mishnayot are the opinion of Rabbi Meir, for example. We can conceive that in a parallel universe, that's how the Mishnah might have been organized. So what the Rambam is praising is the, the organization of the Mishnah. And he tells you that, the, that Rabbi Yudha Nasi organized the Mishnah into six Chalakim. Into six Chalakim, and then he, he lists them for you. But let's, let's just go back to this handy chart. This chart is from a uh, it's from a little pamphlet called Aiding Talmud Study. I think I've mentioned it to you a couple of times. It's by Rav Aryeh Carmel. It's usually available in most Jewish bookshops. It's a really handy little it's a really handy little uh, guide uh, for the student of Gemara. And in the back, they have this this chart and many others. And it's the outline of of the Shisha Sidre Mishnah. Um, there are six orders of the Mishnah. The first is Zroyim. Zrayim literally means seeds, but it has to do laws connected with agriculture, which unfortunately is not so um, applicable uh, today, certainly not in Chutz Laaretz. Even in Eretz Yisrael, it has different meanings. Um, um, it has different meanings to, it has different meanings to, um, to uh, we who live in the post uh, temple era, um, but this deals with things like truma and maaser, the tithes and uh, and uh, obligatory gifts to the kohanim and the Levi'im that have to be separated out from from agricultural produce that's grown in Eretz Yisrael. Um, bikurim, the first fruits that have to be brought as a as a sacrifice, as it were. Anyway, on this chart, oh, what happened to my chart? moment, I seem to have, there you go. Um, okay, um, and the, the first, the first uh, tractate, the first mesechta in the series is brachot, which is not technically about uh, agriculture, but since it, ha it deals with the blessings that you say on the food, which we're about to be describing, it's included here. On this chart, he lists for you how many chapters there are in each Masechta of Mishnah. Each tractate of Mishnah has commentary of the Gemara, of the Talmud. Now, this is, generally speaking, there's the Mishnah and the Gemara. The Gemara is the commentary on the Mishnah, and together, these two pieces, Mishnah plus Gemara, 
together it is it's referred to as the Talmud. Although again, colloquially, usually we refer to the whole thing as Gemara. Um, and he tells you how many folio pages there are in each Masechta. Now you'll see here that in that in Seder Zrayim, only only Brachot has commentary of the Gemara. Most Masechtot, most tractates have um, have Gemara commentary, but not all. There are a few cases most pronounced here in Zrayim of uh, tractates that have no Gemara commentary in the Bavli. Now you see, and I hope that we'll have a chance to talk about this more uh, in the next series after Pesach, there are two versions of the Talmud. There's the Bavli, the Babylonian Talmud, uh, and there's the Jerusalem Talmud. The Jerusalem Talmud is also sometimes called, and it's called the Talmud Yerushalmi. Uh, sometimes in the old days, before it became a more politically charged term, it used to be referred to as the Palestinian Talmud. Um, now we generally refer to it as the Jerusalem Talmud, the Yerushalmi. Um, but you know, once upon a time, the, the newspaper, the English newspaper that, that we know as the Jerusalem Post, uh, before 1948, it was called the Palestine Post. Uh, when people that were born and lived here were called Palestinians. Ruf Cook, you remember Ruf Cook? Mm -hmm. He was a pretty big Zionist. He was a Palestinian because he lived in Palestine before the establishment of the mm -hmm. of the state of Israel. That's what it said on his uh, on his uh, identity card or on his passport. Um, it's only only uh, in latter days uh, that the term Palestinian takes on a different connotation. You see that all of these msechto in in Seder Zroyim, all of them have commentary of the Yerushalmi. Anybody have a guess as to why the Yerushalmi might uh, pay attention to Seder Zroyim in a way that the Bavli doesn't? Anybody yeah, exactly, Esther, correct. <laughs> In other words, the Talmud Yerushalmi was written in, actually probably not in Yerushalayim, it was probably written in the Galil, but, um, but it, uh, it, it is, um, it, it's, it's more practical in a way that life in Chutzlar, it's in Bovel, in what today is, is Iraq, uh, is not. Uh, so that's Seder Zroyim. Then this Seder Moed, Moe deals with the Shabbat and the festivals. So you see the Masechta or Shabbat, Erevin, which is ancillary to Shabbat, talking about the construction of Erevin and the prohibition of, of carrying, Psachim, deals with Pesach, etc. Sukkah, Megillah, Rosh Hashanah, Ta'anit, uh, uh, Chagiga. What, what Chag is missing? Anything, anything noticeably missing from this list? Pesach? Pesach is in Sachim. Well, let me see. No? Joel, are you with us tonight? Okay, so what's missing from Seder Moed? Which Chag is, is missing? It's true that Shavuot is missing, but that's because Shavuot doesn't really have, you know, much to be discussed. Um, there's no Masechet of Shavuot because, halachically speaking, it's not a holiday of the same kind of uh, detail as, as as even Purim, which has its own Masechet. Uh, so, sh so Shavuot is dealt with here and there, in other purposes. Uh, one of the one of the uh, elements of Shavuot had to do with the korbanot that were brought. That's dealt with in the Masech, the old korbanot. Uh, but the fact that um, you know there's no recipe for cheesecake given in the uh, in the <laughs> Gemara, so we don't even say. Chanukah. Where's Chanukah? Chanukah is missing. There's no Masech at Chanukah. There's a, Masechet, there's a Masechet Megillah that deals with, principally with Purim, but not exclusively. There's no Masechet Chanukah. Where, where might the Talmud discuss Chanukah?
In other words, if, if the Talmud doesn't dedicate, or not the Talmud, the Mishnah doesn't dedicate a, um, a, uh, a Masechta to something, um, so the Talmud has to find a place to, to house it. Because the Talmud can't, the Gemara can't make up its own Masechta. It has to work within the framework that Rabbi Yehuda Nasi lays down. Um, so Howard is correct that it's dealt with in Masechet Shabbat. Why in Shabbat? What's the thematic peg on which on which it gets hung? Right, so the candle lighting of Shabbat, so the candle lighting of Hanukkah, and it's discussed, mm -hmm. uh, piggybacked to that. The third seder is Nashim, which mm -hmm. deal with the variety of issues, um, not so much about women per se, but about the relationships between men and women. And then there's some other topics that are piggybacked to that. So, for example, for example, you see that we start with Yevamot. Now, it's interesting. The, the, the Rambam will have something to say about the, about the order of the Mesechtot within each Seder. But just looking at this chart, what might you intuit about how the Mesechtot get ordered within each Seder? It's organized according to size. Yeah, it seems to be organized according to descending size. Yeah. The larger, there's some exceptions. There's some exceptions, um, you know, notably here. Um, but it, generally speaking, it's in descending order of size of chapters. Um, it generally the size of the generally the size of the um, the the pages of Talmud correspond. Because the more chapters of Mishnah, the more pages of Talmud you need, although not always. Because you might have one Masechta that has much much discussion on any given Mishnah. So you see that here, for example, in, in Moed, uh, Erevin has fewer Dapim than, than Psachim. It could um, be that the uh, size relates to importance, too. Um, well, it's hard to say. In other words, there's some topics, there's some Masechtot, yeah. That, look, I mean, you wouldn't want to. It'd be hard to say what's more important than than another. Um, mm -hmm. But um, you know, there's certain topics that are a little more grave than others. So, for example, Shabbat is obviously um, more complex, let's mm -hmm. say, than than uh, than Megillah or even or even Sukkah, mm -hmm. just because Shabbat is is much much more complex. There's more, it's more frequent, but it's also, you have to deal with all of the mitzvot assay, mm -hmm. candle lighting and kiddush and, and lecha mishnah, etc. And certainly all the mitzvot, lo assay, the 39 melachot, and the isurei dirabana. And there's just, there's just many more topics to deal with. Yeah. Shabbat, of course, is also a stringent, deals with stringencies and severities that you don't have in Masechet Megillah, Mm -hmm. which is, of course, dealing almost principally with a Dirabonim. Um, but it's hard to say that one is more important than the other. I mean, Pesachim is also, Pesach is also pretty important. And it also deals with very severe halachot, about chametz and not eating chametz. You know, it's coming up. Maybe you've started to clean. So, uh, <laughs> so you know that it's like a big deal. So it's hard to say important. It's hard to say what's more important and what's not more important, but the larger the mesechta, it's probably an indicator of the complexity of the topic under uh -huh. under discussion. Um, so it seems that the organization in any one seder has something to do with the size, and from the size you can intuit something about the, about the content. Um, so nashim deals with mostly the relationships between men and women. So, for example, kiddushin deals with how marriage is formed. Uh, Gittin talks about how marriage is unformed. The fact that Gittin comes before Kedushin is because Gittin is more complicated than Kedushin and has more chapters, etc. There are, of course, some that have tried to say a uh, svarot about why you would put divorce before marriage, but uh, but those are generally, you know, the types of you know cynical comments that people have about yeah. marriage. Um, there's some other topics dealt with in Nashim. That aren't 
that aren't necessarily man and woman or husband and wife related, but insofar as marriage is constituted through some kind of um, some kind of uh, vow, uh, some type of commitment between husband and wife or from husband to wife, the Gemara also deals with with Msechet Nidarim, um, which has to do with, with vows and promises. Um, contract. And, uh, a type of contract, I suppose. It's a type of contract, I suppose. And there it is right after to vote, which is, of course, the marriage contract. Mm-hmm. The marriage contract. Nizikin, Nizikin is the, you know, is civil law, uh, mm-hmm. property law, damages, etc. It also has to do with uh, the organization of the courts there in Sechet Sanhedrin and Makot um, Shavuot deals. This is not Shavuot Shavuos, the cheesecake holiday. This is Shavuot uh, um, uh, oaths uh, that a court might that a court might um, impose on on someone to take a shavua, uh an oath in in court and 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 elsewise, etc. And right there is right there is Msechet Avot, which we're going to have something to say in a in a moment. Uh Kudshim deals with Kudshim deals with the sacrifices and Taharot deals with uh the the whole realm of Tahor and Tame and purity and impurity, etc. You'll you'll notice that Taharot also is largely lacking in Gimara. Both in, both in the Bavli as well as, as well as the Yerushalmi. The Rambam. So these, those are the, the Shisha Sidre Mishnah, Zroyim, Moed, Nashim, Nizikin, Kodshim, and Taharot. It's known by the acronym Zman Nakat, which you know either may or may not help you, may or may not help you uh, remember. The Rambam says, "Kara kol chelik mehem seder." The Kara chelik arishon seder zrayim sheni moed shlishi nashim nizikin kodshim tarot. Um, and then let me just skip ahead a bit. Then the Rambam gets into this interesting discussion where he looks at each save there and he explains the flow within each and every of the six sederim, explaining why this Masechta comes before that Masechta. Now, it's interesting that he does this because, as Esther pointed out, it seems pretty clear why one Masechta comes before another. It has something to do with with size. It has something to do with with the the size of the of the uh, of the mesechta, and that Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi was not necessarily trying to make a statement about the organization of knowledge within any one within any one um, within any one uh, topic. Even even if you look at if you look at Moed. So Moed, if somebody was telling you that they're organizing the book, let's say you have, look, I have a, I have a nice uh, library here. I'm sitting in a nice library here. When I was younger and I had fewer books and I had more room and I didn't share my house with children that I love but who take up some space, I, my library was a picture of organization. It was, I had my own intuitive you know, Jeffrey decimal system where, mm-hmm. you know, this book was next to that book and it was obvious to anyone that knew anything about Jewish books yeah. why one was next to the other. Now mm-hmm. the books are all organized based upon where they fit. And I still have, like, piles. Uh, I still have, you know, piles of the odd book here and there, you know, uh, there you go. Like, there's, like, the new acquisitions pile that haven't found a home yet. And uh, you know, and and over there are the books that that fit above on those narrow shelves above the desk, etc. Um, I'll give you just a virtual tour. Um, 
but if I but my books on the Jewish holidays on the Chagim, well, all the books on on Shabbat were organized together, obviously, and then all the books on the Chagim. How do you think they were organized? What what, what would be a reasonable way to organize them? According to the year. Yeah, according to the calendar of the year. Yeah. Either yeah. starting either starting with yeah. Rosh Hashanah. And then oh, the yeah. books on Yom Kippur were after Rosh Hashanah, and the books on Sukkot were after Yom Kippur, and then you had Hanukkah, and then you had, and then you had, uh, uh, then you had Purim, and then you had the Pesach books, etc., etc. Right? But look at Seder Moe. That's not how it's organized. That's not, it's neither organized chronologically according to the calendar, in which case Rosh Hashanah, in which case Rosh Hashanah, which is here should have been before Yuma, which deals with which deals with Yom Kippur, Yoma, Yoma, the day. Right? It's a nickname for it's a it's a nickname for, for Yom Kippur. So Rosh Hashanah should have been before Yom Kippur and in all cases they should have been next to each other. Right? Mm-hmm. So there's no organization. Beitza here deals generally with the laws of Yom Tov, right? And it's stuck there in the middle, nipped in of everything else. Right? So the fact that Shabbat comes first, that Shabbat is Rishon Hu the Mikroi Kodesh, that we say that Shabbat is the the first among the Jewish holy days, um, it, it's first, but it's there obviously not because it's Rishon Hu the Mikroi Kodesh, it's there it's first because it's the biggest of the Masechtot. Right? And, uh, you know, so there's no, there doesn't seem to be a thematic connection. But nevertheless, the Rambam gives this drasha, which is, seems to be clear. By here, by drasha, I mean a homily. I don't mean drasha with a capital D, like we were talking about uh, a, a little while ago about um, you know the exegesis of the psukim. It's a drasha. It's a homily. It's a you know, he's trying to explain the organization of of each of each seder. Now, even though he was obviously aware. That uh, like what Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi's you know uh, principle of organization was within any one seder, but nevertheless he thought we could learn something about the connection of knowledge, and even that you know even that you know is says something that the the organization of the mesechtot you know we can even ex post facto look at it and. And, and make a statement about the connection of fields of wisdom. Elsewhere, the Rambam has, a, has an idea that the real pinnacle of Jewish learning is to be able to extrapolate everything that you know to everything else. Mm-hmm. He's talking in a specific context, uh, not, not in a general context, uh, so it's not a completely uh, fair to, to to apply it here, but for the Rambam, that notion of the 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 uh, interconnections, the integrative nature of all knowledge. So you can take any you know twenty books and like lay them out on your dining room table, and be able to connect the dots of of how everything is is you know like a I mean pardon me almost like a a parlor game you know like uh, what are they called six degrees of separation. Right, so there's a, to explain like how all of how all of knowledge is organized. It's an integrative. It, it's like the the um, the metaphor that we use of the the Yam HaTalmud, the sea of of Jewish learning. Mm-hmm. You know, there's that lovely poster from Beit Hatzfutzot. I'm sure if you Google it, uh, you can find a picture of it online of the the Yam HaTalmud from Beit Hatzfutzot from the Diaspora Museum oh. in Tel Aviv. Um, which, which literally, lo- looking like a like a map of the of an ocean and the continents, shows the traces the traces the um, traces the uh, the history of the Torah Shmuel from Moshe up until the 20th century. Let me see if I can find that. Where is it? 
I can't. Oh, here you go. Um, oh, beautiful, beautiful. There's a beautiful. Uh, I think it seems to be interactive, even. Yeah, I'm putting the link up in the up in the box. Um, but the 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 the, uh, the visual metaphor of there you go. The link is up in the chat. If you if you're able, to just look at it for a second. The visual metaphor of the Yam HaTalmud is is a telling one for a number of reasons. Um, you know, just like the ocean is, just like the ocean is interconnected. If I put my toe, you know, in the water, uh, if I put my toe in the water in the Mediterranean, so it, you know, I'm somehow connected through the ether to the person standing in New Jersey with his toe in the Atlantic, uh, to the person in even in far-flung Hawaii with their toe in the Pacific. That's what the Jewish learning is. That's why it's the metaphor of, of, of the ocean. Oh. And that's why the Torah is compared it's to... Good. That's why the Torah is compared to... To what? What's the classic metaphor for Torah? Is water. Mm -hmm. right? And it's in Chazal... Hazal use use the notion of water. Oh. Torah is compared to water partially because of this, you know, the, the connection between mm -hmm. you know, between uh, between all of the constituent parts and the flow mm -hmm. of, of of everything. So that I assume is part of what the Rambam is trying to telegraph with this lengthy digressive uh, homily on the connection between the mesechdot and why one flows into the other when again it's pretty obvious what the real what the real uh, organizational uh, purpose of it was however the rambam goes into this discussion um, here let me just skip ahead the rambam goes into this lengthy discussion the side point when he gets to Mesechet Avot. Now, we all know Avot. Avot is also called Pirkei Avot, the chapters of the Father, cha chapters of the Fathers, um, Mesechet Avot. Hey, what is Mesechet Avot dealing with? What's, what's, what's the issue that's dealt with? It's relationship of man to man. Yeah, man to man, ethics. Yeah, um, ethics. Yeah. It's sometimes it translated as the ethics of the fathers. Yeah. Um, when so Masechet Avot is is in Seder Nezikin, is in the section that deals with how the courts should work, how uh, how uh, the civil law works. Mm -hmm. So the Rambam says here, Kasher Nishlamlo Kol Mashit Tzarich Alav Hashofet. Right after discussing everything that a judge needs needs to know, hechel the avot. Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi starts discussing Masechet avot. Now this is particularly interesting because avot is in many ways the odd man out. It's really the Masechta which belongs everywhere and nowhere. There's no uh, on the on the surface of it, there's no reason that it should be in any one say there over the other, um, because it doesn't fit in, you know, clearly with any of the others. Even brachot, which in its say there in Zra'im, is the odd man out, but we we understand why it's there. Uh, brachot deals with brachot, with blessings that you say over food. Piggyback to that discussion is the entire topic of prayer, of tefillah, and of shema, um, but, but that's there because of its connection to, to blessings, um, all of the different types of prayers uh, that, that you make. Um, but, um, but insofar as it, the bulk of it deals with the brachot before and after eating, um, so then put it into the, into the seder that deals with the production of food. Um, but avot is really it, it's it's just so different than every other masechta in its content, in its in its area of focus, in its concern, in its style. It, it's really 
it's really uh, unusual uh, compared to the other sectot of Mishnah. So why is it here in Nizikin after the discussion of you know who, how judges function? So he says there's shte kavanot. There's shte, there are two reasons. Hachat lahodiacha amitat hamesoret v'hakabala shehi emet. The Kiblu Ha Rabim Me Rabim, the Fihach Roy the Chabed Ish Hecham, Ulehach Shivo a Hashivut Eliona. The Fishegia Kabalai loves Ubedoro Kamo Elbedorotea. That a vote is a testimony both to the integrity of the Masora because it's talking about the Chochmeh HaMasora. Uh, it's talking about the, the nature of the, of the Rabbanim, of Chazal. Mm -hmm. And therefore, studying that leads you to appreciate uh, and, to, and to, um, to appreciate and to, and to respect Chachamim. And that might be a worthy effort to make when talking about the role and scope and powers and authority of the bateidin, of the judges. Mm -hmm. okay. um, and it, then he points out the kachamru. Yeah, this is a gemara in Rosh Hashanah. In banu, uh, it's actually a mission in Rosh Hashanah. In banu lachkor achar beit dino shel Rabban Gamliel v'chulei v'chulei. Vamru, here he has a different gear, so Shimshon Bedaro, Kishmul Bedaro, we talk about Yiftach Bedaro, Kishmul Bedaro. That each and every generation, even though we have this notion of Pchita Tadarot, of, of Yurida Tadarot, that somehow our generation isn't as worthy or holy or great, our leaders are not as, uh, as remarkable as those of the generation that came before them, and those are the generations that became for them, nevertheless, the authority of the leadership in each and any generation is equivalent to the authority of the generations that came before. Um, and this is part of the context of a larger discussion, um, uh, a topic that we discussed actually in the very beginning when we were discussing uh, uh, the Gemara about Tanur Shalachnai, uh, this is the Machloket in Rosh Hashanah about the calendar, uh, that if we're going to start examining uh, the Bet Din of Rabban Gamliel, it calls into question all of the Batei Din, that we have to have belief in the integrity of the system in each and every generation. Mm -hmm. And that might be one of the purposes of, of the placement of Masechet Avot here, because it reinforces this. yesh musar and we turn the page. Shalo Yamru. Shalo Yamru Adam, Shalo Yamru. Mishpat Ploni Nikabel. Oh, Bitakanat Ploni Naamin. Vena Devar came. In other words, the Chachamim themselves, the Chachamim themselves are great because they are subservient to the law that they serve. Um, even though he makes this idea that, uh, that we don't, in other words, uh, you know, like in America, it, it, it's uh, common to refer to to refer to um, different uh, periods, like in constitutional law. Uh, uh, there was this piece I was reading this week about the American Supreme Court. They talk about the Roberts Court versus the Rehnquist Court versus yeah. the Warren Court. Yeah. Uh, so even though we also talk about this Beit Dino Shel Rebbein Gamliel, but the Rambam's making the point it's not the it's not the it's not the the mishpat of Rabbi Gamliel. It's not the mishpat of Rabbi Akiva. It's not the it's the mishpat of Hashem, and they are part of the 
the they happen whoever is in the din whoever's in the court at any given point is the is the uh, emissary of God at any given point. They're the interpreters of the divine at any given point, but they are subservient to they are subservient to to, uh, to 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 God. Um, let me. Uh, and and here the Rambam you know makes this other point. Hold on. That therefore it's imperative for each and every judge to prepare himself, to dedicate himself, to educate himself to all of the topics that are that are addressed in Masechet Avot, which are matters of ethics, which are matters of the refinement of the human personality. Mm -hmm. um, midot, what, what, what we call colloquially midot, Rambam sometimes calls deot, personality traits. Um, uh, ben and Barbara mentioned in the chat that Avot seems to not be so argumentative. Correct. It's not argumentative in the sense of of um, of trying to determine what the pesach halacha is. As a matter of fact, Rabbi Soloveitchik made the point that avot is different than every other mesechta because in every other mesechta, if there's a machloket about sukkah, where the sukkah is this or that, we need a resolution. We need to know that this is what a sukkah normatively is because we all need to be sitting in the same sukkah. Uh, we all meaning in the same. We all need to have one definition for what a sukkah is, but in avot you don't have the resolution. If there are two different opinions about orientations, about outlook, so we don't need to have a resolution to that. We don't need to have a resolution to that. Uh, um, you know about this is a, a preferable way of looking at something, or that's a preferable way of looking at something. It's it's left open to to different uh, different interpretations, as it as it were. Let me again just skip ahead. We're running out of time a little bit. Uh, here, let me just go ahead. To after then, the organize after then. Um, after the mission is organized, uh, the mission is organized. The mission is organized into nispeima kol halukat ma'amar be ba'ayu kol mesechtot hamishna shishim va'achat. There's sixty-one mesechtot u'mispara prakim. Chamesh mod ve esrim ushlosha, 523 uh, chapters of Mishnah. Now, it, 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 it would be a good undertaking for anyone to learn every Mishnah in Shas. Now, you know that we have this project called the Daf Yomi, yeah. where, where you learn a Daf, meaning two, okay. two sides of a page. Mm -hmm. Two sides of the same page, a folio page of Gemara every day, and in about seven and a half years, you finish all of Shas. And they have a big celebration. They have big celebrations all around the world. That's a worthy thing to do, but maybe even more worthy is to, from an educational point of view, from a social point of view, the Dafyomi is a fantastic thing. Even though very often people say that they don't retain everything that they learn. But if you were to learn all of the Mishnah, which is an undertaking that you could do, if not in a year, then in a year and a half. If you learned, uh, if you learned the Perik a day, a chapter of Mishnah a day, uh, you could do it in about a year and a half. Um, if you do a chapter and a half a day, you can do it in about, uh, about a year. If you do uh, ten, let's say ten chapters a week, 
uh, you can do it in about a year. Now, I know this because I did it once. You have to be a little bit obsessive, uh, otherwise you fall behind. But um, but if you if you were to do that, you would amass a tremendous amount of knowledge. And since there are many wonderful tools that enable people to learn the Mishnah and to make sense of it, and to even determine what's the halacha la ma'aseh, because that's not always apparent from the Mishnah, or even the kahati, which gives you all the background. You know, the, do you know what the kahati is? Pinchas kahati. With Pinchas kahati, he was so he lived in Bayt Vagan. He must have died about 20 years ago or so. He, he actually worked in the bank. And, but he was a Tamil Chacham, he was a scholar, uh, and he wrote a commentary on the Mishnah, which was meant to give you all of the background information you need to learn any one particular Mishnah. He never assumes any outside knowledge uh, beyond the previous Mishnah. Uh, if you're reading a Mishnah and you can't make sense of it, then learn the previous Mishnah, and if all of the knowledge that you need isn't there, he's going to end up giving it to you by way of introduction. So even if all you were to do were to read the introduction, and the Kahati, I think the commentary of Kahati has also been translated into English uh, as well, and you can get that. Um, if you were just to read the introductions to each Masechta, which he has, he has a, an introduction to each Masechta, sometimes also to each Seder, if you were just to read the introductions to the 61 Masechtot, most of which is not more than a page or two, you would amass a lot of very, very useful knowledge. It would fill in a lot of gaps in your in your knowledge. Now, again, don't get me wrong. Learning nearly the introductions written by Rav Kahati uh, is not the same as actually learning the Mishnayos. Uh, but th this is a worthy uh, this is a worthy uh, 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 endeavor to undertake. It's a project that you can undertake. Mm -hmm. That's the Mishnah. The Rambam then points out that Rabbi Chia composed in the in the footsteps of his great teacher and master, Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, he composed the Tosefta. Now, we've spoken about this before. Mm -hmm. The Tosefta, do not confuse Tosefta with Tosfot or Tosfos, the commentary that appears on the side of the Gemara, um, on the inside margin of the Gemara. The Tosefta is something else entirely. Uh, the Tosefta is an appendix to the Mishnah. It's usually printed at the back of every uh, volume of Talmud. You can find the Tosefta, or of course there are also editions just of the Tosefta. The Tosefta is an appendix to the Mishnah. It's written in a style that looks and feels and smells like the Mishnah, but it's of secondary uh, authority and importance to the Mishnah. Then he also points out, the Ram also points out, that there were other Tanaetic works, works from the period of the Chachamim of the Mishnah, particularly the Sifra and the Sifre. The Sifra is the, is the Medrash Halacha to Sefer Vayikra, which we're starting this week. The Sifre is the Medrash Halacha on Bamidbar and Dvarim. On the, on the numbers in Deuteronomy. Um, what the Sifra has another name. It has another nickname. Uh, does anybody does anybody know what that is? Rashi calls it something else. No? Anyone? So the Rambam, the, the Ram Rashi also refers to, not just Rashi, but Rashi specifically refers to the Sifra as Torat Kohanim as Torah Kohanim, because it deals with Vayikra, so it deals with uh, many in Leviticus, it deals with uh, many of the things related to the Kohanim and the Korbanot and, and, and etc. Although, obviously, not only that. So, so when Rashi quotes Torah Kohanim, he's quoting the Sifra, which is a the Medrash Halacha on Sefer Vayikra. On Sefer Vayikra. Um, this body of Tanaetic literature the 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 principally again principally again the Mishnah. One moment, let me just skip ahead here. Principally the Mishnah, the Rambam says, 
וכל מי שעמד אחריו, all those that came after Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, again, the mission is completed around the year 200, everyone that comes afterwards, אחרי אותו החבורה הנכבדה, after the mission is composed, אמנם, or the group of חכמים, אמנם הייתה תכליתו הבנת דברי המשנה, ולא חדל דור אחר דור להתבונן בה לפרשה. People were focused on the proper commentary and interpretation of the Mishnah, and never was there a generation which neglected the study and interpretation of the Mishnah. כל חכם לפי ערך החמתו ובינתו, ונחלקו בפירושי כיצד הלכות ממנו במשך השנים. It's not surprising that the Amoroyim, the Chachamim that came in the period in the, in the 300 or so years after the Mishnah is composed, that there were differences of opinion about the proper interpretation of certain halachot, of certain Mishnayot. Ve'en kat shelo hitbanana ba ve'holida mimenu toladot ve'chakra mimenu chakirot ad shehegiya hazman shel ravina ve'rav ashi ve'hem sof chokmei talmud. And then, just like Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi undertook this massive uh, undertaking of organizing all of the teaching of teachings of the Chachamim in the generations prior to him, after about 300 years of commentary and debate on on uh, on the Mishnah, Ravina and Rav Ashi undertake a similar project of of composing what we call the Gemara. Now again, they don't have, they, since, since Rebbe, since Rebbe Yehuda Hanasi has already done this, has already done this, they don't need to undertake the organizational project. They use the outline, they yeah. use the skeleton of the Mishnah to organize their discussion. The Dewey Decimal System's already been set up. They're just trying to figure out how to organize their library of teaching based upon the same framework. And they organize their discussions around the Mishnayot, around the Mishnayot. Now, there are going to be certain discussions that don't fit in with the Mishnah, like the Hanukkah discussion, because Hanukkah is not discussed in the Mishnah. So they have to find a place where thematically it fits. Mm -hmm. In the best. Or they have to find the, the springboard that's most appropriate for a new discussion. Right? And, and sometimes you can wonder how the Gemara gets from one thing to the other. And the, the Gemara is much more associative in that way than the, than the, um, than the Mishnah is. Mm -hmm. um, because the Mishnah is a smaller work, it's a tighter work. Um, the, the Mishnah doesn't have agadic material, or it largely doesn't have agadic material, which has to be organized, uh, you know, as well. The Ramans may mention that in a moment. The hitbodeid of Ashi lechaber lechaber chibur v'ra'al asot b'divrei kol mishaba achrei Rabbeinu Hakadosh kasher asa Rabbeinu Hakadosh b'divrei kol mishaba achrei Moshe. So Ravina and Ravashi do for the 300 years of, of interpretation what Rabbeinu HaKadosh, what Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi did for everything up until, from Moshe Rabbeinu up until his day. The kibetz kol ma'amrei ha'omrim ve'itbonenut ha'mitbonenim u'ferusha mifarshim ve'dikdei kashmuot ve'kibzan ve'ekiv ve'akol ve'dato ve'asher chananu Hashem mirocha ve'alei ve'avat ha'chachma Chiber HaTalmud, the organization and the composition of the Talmud, what we call the Gemara. The Sam Kavanato Bo Arbaad Varim. And there were four areas of, of focus in, in the Gemara. In the Gemara. So let's just talk about these and then we'll continue with this when we meet again after Pesach. HaEchad, Perush HaMishnah, the first objective of the Gemara is to interpret the Mishnah. 
וכל מה שנפל בדברים המסופקים, שבא ממחלוקת הפירושים, וטענות כל מפרש על חברו, וגילוי טענת האמת, וזו הכוונה הראשונה שנתכוון, to interpret the Mishnah and to arrive at a normative interpretation and a normative law. השני, פסק הלכה כדת אחד החוקים אשר נפלה מחלוקתם בגוף המשנה או בפירושה או במוצא ממנו uh, המוקש עליו. So this is, this is the determining the, the first is determining the proper interpretation, the second is determining the proper normative law. השלישי, התולדות אשר הולידו חכמי כל דור מן המשנה וגילוי העיקרים והראיות אשר למדו מהם וסמכו עליהם התנאים המדברים במשנה עד שנקבע מדברי מה שנקבע והגזירות והתקנות אשר נתקנו אחרי רבינו הקדוש עד אליו. So there's new material, there are new things, there are תולדות, there are descendants, their discussion has continued and new issues come up and applications of old principles have to be made and new גזירות and תקנות, new institutions and new declarations and new prohibitions and new mitzvot and things arise and we have to deal with them as they come up because no one book, no matter how encyclopedic, no matter how uh, wonderful or, or great the accomplishment of the Mishnah, no one book can cover everything. So as new things come up, there are toledo, there are new topics and that also has to be dealt with. And the fourth, drashot matzimot l'inyan kol perek she'iz damein shintabo drash. This is what we call Agada. Agada, and the Rambam will discuss that uh, in the upcoming chapters. Uh, the the whole realm of the uh, of 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 Agada, which we talked about a little bit uh, last uh, in the last semester when we learned the Hagdama la Perik and we will get into further. So that's the outline of the Talmud. And the Rambam will continue from there. When we continue after Pesach, I wish you all a Chag Kosher V'Sameach, a happy and healthy, meaningful yeah. uh, Pesach. Yeah. And Bezrus Hashem will have the opportunity to continue learning afterwards. Thank you very much. Laila Tov. Laila Tov.